Pablo Picasso est mort ce matin dans sa maison de Mougins. Il avait 80 ans. C'est l'un des très grands maîtres du XXe siècle, bien sûr, qui disparaît. Tous les volets de la villa sont clos et personne n'est admis à pénétrer dans... At the time of his death, in April 1973, age 91, Pablo Picasso had become one of the 20th century's most influential and prolific artists. Picasso has been painted as many men, as a genius, a womanizer, an egomaniac. Brought up in the Spanish town of Malaga, his first paintings as a nine-year-old were of bullfighting scenes. Later, he would represent himself as the mythological minotaur, half man, half bull. The bull craved women, who would feed his life and his art. Their encounters produced the 20th century's most extraordinary portraits, as Picasso reconstructed the female form to the point of total abstraction. Many of these women would find themselves damaged forever. For the first time, the people who knew him best tell the story of those women to give a new insight into the artist and his work. First time I met Picasso, I was struck by the enormous power that seemed to emanate from this very small man. What struck me particularly was this Spanish concept from south of Spain, Mirada Fuerte, the strong gaze. And people in Andalusia feel that they can have a woman with their eyes. It's like an extra human, uh, uh, like a limb. And Picasso seemed to have that. One felt the eyes were enormously are powerful. More than any other 20th century artist, Picasso's art was drawn from his relationships. He always avoided publicly linking his women with his art, but through his paintings, etchings and sculptures, every life he touched becomes visible. He was an artist with an astonishing diversity of styles, often inspired by the women he was with. When the woman in Picasso's life changes, everything else changes, uh, this, the, the poet changes, the circle of friends change, the house changes, everything changes with the mistress. And I watched this happen, and that was totally fascinating. Picasso always defined clear periods like patterns in his work. It was as if this was his way of mapping out his life and his creativity. Many of Picasso's works are depictions of the women he loved. Some of the titles are clear. Portrait of Olga in an armchair. Portrait of Dora Maar. Jacqueline with crossed hands. But some are more mysterious. Study for woman's head. The dream. Woman with yellow necklace. In each period, in fact with each different woman, he had a sort of leitmotif. Like in Wagner, you can hear it in his work, the leitmotif that introduces each character. In Picasso, you can see it. So my own leitmotif was always the blue and green. If you ask Picasso questions he, about his work, he very often uh, dismissed them and he wasn't interested. But with me, uh, we'd go through a catalogue or something and he'd start telling me who, in fact, these portraits were of. I mean, that's not Dora, that's partly Dora, but there was a little bit of Francoise there. And then some of these paintings, there are four women in one thing. I mean, there's Dora, there's the Nouche Eliwa, there's uh, Roland Penrose's wife, the photographer, and Inez, the maid, at the local hotel, and they're all there. Pablo Picasso was born in Malaga in 1881. At first, it was thought he was stillborn. He would always tell the story of how, when he was born, he seemed to hesitate, motionless, before at last making his entrance into the world with a great cry. Don José Ruiz, his father, was a drawing teacher and a not very successful painter. 
Young Pablo could draw before he could talk. The first word he spoke was lapis, pencil. His father taught him to draw pigeons, but before long he was fascinated by the bullfight. Quite a spectacle for a child seeing a great arena for the first time. Don Jose was not just astonished by his son, he was completely dazzled. So he decided to give his young prodigy a proper training. He took him to the Prado in Madrid. It was Pablo's first encounter with the Spanish masters, and it opened his eyes. Goya. Velasquez. He discovered the whole tradition of Spanish epic and realist painting. Don Jose hoped to turn Pablo into a great classical painter, but Pablo's dream was to paint life as it really is, with all its suffering and its doubts. His personal quest had begun, and Pablo started turning out self-portraits that were a long way from the academic style he wanted to leave behind. In ebullient, avant-garde Barcelona, Gaudi was changing the face of architecture, while students veered from Nietzschean philosophy to Catalan nationalism. Pablo whiled away his time at the Four Cats Cabaret with the poet Chaim Sabates, the painter Casajemas, and Manuel Payares, who would all become lifelong friends. He first tasted the pleasures of the flesh in the brothels of the Carrer de Avignon. He drowned himself in the arms of prostitutes, waking in him a love of paid-for fantasies. The 18-year-old boy would all his life have a fascination with physical love. Eroticism now appeared in his work and would never leave it. Exasperated with his father's constant disapproval of his bohemian lifestyle, Pablo decided to leave for Paris, wellspring of the Art Nouveau that was taking Europe by storm. Along with Casa Jemez and Payares, Pablo explored the nightlife of the Belle Epoque. They went to the Moulin Rouge in Montmartre, to the Chat Noir and the Moulin de la Galette. On these nights on the town, the three friends took artist models from Amartre with them, sensual, independent young women who would happily pose naked for all the painters in their studios. Laure Florentin was one of them. In Montmartre, she was known as Germaine. Picasso's friend Casajemus fell passionately and violently in love with her. None of his friends knew, though, that Casajemus suffered from congenital impotence and could not satisfy his young beauty's desires. Since she wanted more than the platonic love that was all he could give her, Germaine dropped him. Casajemus, spouting tears and threats, started drinking heavily. In a moment of despair, he decided to shoot his mistress, crying, So much for you! Germaine escaped with her life, but only just. Casajemus turned the gun on himself, muttering, So much for me. This time, he didn't miss. The death of such a dear friend was a heavy blow. In that year of 1901, pain found its irrevocable way into Picasso's brushstrokes. These paintings shed light on a key moment in the life and work of the young painter. Laid out in his coffin, all the colour had drained out of Casajemus, and soon only blue would remain. Blue for the fragility of existence. Blue for cold. Blue for death. From now on, Pablo would paint what he saw, but above all, what he felt. Poverty, solitude, deprivation. After two years of misery and blue, Pablo managed to shake off the death of his friend in a masterpiece entitled Life. 
the impotent Casachemus and Germaine, unable to have children, confront the specter of maternity. But it's still with a heavy heart, felt in his work, that at 22 years old, the young painter moved into an insalubrious, damp and dirty building. His friend, the poet Max Jacob, named it the Bateau Lavoir, the laundry boat. There, Max read Baudelaire and Verlaine to Pablo, who was at last happy with this life of a painter among poets. With Max, and now with Guillaume Apollinaire, whom he met in a sleazy bar near the Gare Saint-Lazare. The two poets had been the only ones to stand up for Pablo's gloomy and grim paintings, but now they would witness a sudden metamorphosis of their friend. This portrait on a scrap of cardboard found in Picasso's house after his death is the record of a brief and passionate affair that, till the end of his days, Pablo would never talk of. Her name was Madeleine, and thanks to her, Picasso now saw La Vie en Rose. Pablo had discovered the Madrano Circus in the foothills of Montmartre, where he spent hours chatting with the clowns. Sharing a few moments of the life of these travelling folk quickly impacted on Picasso's painting in this series on performers, acrobats and their family life. Dreaming of fatherhood with La Belle Madeleine, he painted himself as a harlequin. But all too soon, Madeleine was eclipsed by another. She walked into his life one summer evening as a thunderstorm shook the Bateau Lavoir. Amélie Lang was a model on the run from her violent husband and was enjoying many affairs in the studios of Montmartre. They called her Fernande. Il n'aimait pas être dérangé, on venait frapper, tout le monde venait. Alors, il travaillait la nuit. Il se levait vers 4-5 heures, il faisait ce qu'il avait à faire, il dînait, il rentrait et à 8 heures jusqu'à 6 heures du matin, quelquefois il travaillait, assis par terre devant son chevalet. Comme il n'avait pas beaucoup d'argent, il recouvrait ses toiles anciennes euh, par d'autres peintures. Il y a des toiles qui, qui ont deux, trois couches. J'étais désolée chaque fois qu'il qu recouvrait une toile parce que je trouvais que c'était très beau ce qu'il faisait. Pablo, ever the possessive ladies' man, managed to ensnare the delightful Fernande in his web and trapped her in his studio. It was an opium-infused prison of love and painting. Under the drug's influence, they lost themselves in their own fantasy world. Summer, 1906. Two friends, Max Jacob and Guillaume Apollinaire, were trying to carry a heavy trunk full of tubes of paint and blank canvases. Pablo had decided to go away with Fernand, on the money from art dealer Ambroise Vollard, who had bought all the paintings from his pink period. Fernand, no doubt, would have preferred a more pleasant destination, but Pablo had chosen the dry and lonely landscape of Gossal, in the Catalan mountains. Les terres sont ocre, les ciels sont bleus, mais d'un bleu spécial. Il y a des, les maisons sont euh, crayeuses, en forme de cube, beaucoup. If Picasso felt the need to seek out his Spanish roots, it was because he was besieged by doubts about how much his paintings actually meant. He had been bowled over by the Ongres retrospective at the Grand Palais. There, for the first time, a picture that had been considered too scandalous was shown. Picasso was dazzled by the Turkish bath. He was not the only one to fall under its spell. Henri Matisse, the flag bearer of the Fauvist movement, had that spring presented the joy of life, inspired by the Turkish bath, and its colors had aroused Picasso's indignation. The picture troubled him. No doubt for the first time in his life, he felt rather